Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. We're going to give just a few minutes here for everyone to join in who has been waiting before we start our program. Hello again to folks waiting. We're just giving it a few more seconds here to let our attendees pal in and we will get started here shortly. All right, as my doorbell rings, I think we are at 3.03. <laughs> um, forgive that doorbell sound. We'll go ahead and get started. Thank you again to everyone for joining us um, for really such a timely and important discussion that we are having this afternoon. Uh, my name is Rakia Ramsey. I'm the Director of Policy and Advocacy at Truman Center for National Policy and the Truman National Security Project. For those who may be unfamiliar, Truman is a progressive national security organization with a nationwide membership of diverse leaders. We are united in the belief that America is strongest when we stand with our allies to lead, support, and defend a growing global community of free people and just societies. And we firmly believe that that effort should start at home, which is why events like this one are key to understanding present day security challenges like technology and artificial intelligence and its applications. So today I have the pleasure of introducing our moderator um, for today's event, Jennifer Atala. Jennifer is the founder of Anara Strategies LLC, an impact strategy consultancy focused on building tech innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystems globally. She is also our Truman National Security Project North Carolina Chapter Director, a Middle East foreign policy analyst, and is currently authoring her first book. Without further ado, uh, we'll hand it over to you, Jennifer, to introduce our panelists. Go ahead and take it away. Thank you so much, Rakia. Uh, I am so excited about this panel and I cannot take credit for it at all. I just happen to have an awesome rock star AI specialist in my North Carolina chapter and that is Igor Yavlokov. Igor is the, a pioneer in voice recognition technology. He named Alexa, as you know her today, um, and his early company was one of the first acquisitions by Amazon for that technology, and he's currently the founder and CEO of Prion, and he is the one who we have to thank for pulling together this awesome uh, group of panelists. Uh, we also are joined with, by Michael Kanan, who is, uh, who's had a career in the U.S. Air Force um, and is currently leading a partnership with MIT Artificial Intelligence, and he is the author of the book T Minus AI. Um, and finally, we are joined by um, AI leader Ashish Bansal, who has expertise in big tech enterprise applications, particularly in the banking and social media industries. And he's the author of Advanced NLP, Natural Language Processing with TensorFlow. Um, we're really excited about this particular group of panelists um, because they really bring the cross-section of application and leadership on um, this topic um, with Michael having worked at, in academia and military with Ashish having come from industry and big tech applications in social media. Um, and then with Igor sort of spanning the gamut, having worked in bid tech, but then um, as an entrepreneur as well to develop AI at a quote unquote brisker uh, pace. And so he has intersected with each of their worlds. And so I really couldn't think of a, a better group of people to be here today to talk about um, AI and national security broadly and what that means um, even down to the individual level. So I want to start with um, our promise to you, which is that we do not want to just talk about AI and national security in the same way that it is always talked about. 
Um, there are some big issues that we definitely want to address from the national security, um, sort of more mainstream national security perspective, such as China and geopolitics and jobs and things like that. And we will talk about those, but we really want to go beyond that and take it from the sort of um, the wonky discussion that we could easily have <laughs> also down to the intersection with education, um, STEM, with ethics and parenting. I mean, even down to that level of what is happening now? What do we already have in our worlds? How are we benefiting from AI? And what agency do we have to move this technology forward and to sort of reclaim, um, again, our own agency as we interact with this technology on a daily basis? Uh, and so with that, um, I'd like to start with that bigger picture question. There really isn't a better time than now to be talking about this. Um, earlier this month, we had an over 700 page report uh, published by the National Security Commission on artificial intelligence. Um, I have it up right now. It's actually, if you include the title page, 756 pages. Uh, that is a lot. Um, and so we have a lot of urgency here now within the US government to talk about how AI will impact our economy, national security, and welfare. Um, and so, you know, I want to actually begin with a quote from that report um, and then turn it to our panelists. Uh, at the very beginning, this report states that America is not prepared to defend or compete in the AI era. This is the tough reality we must face, and it is this reality that demands comprehensive whole of nation action. Our final report, this is quoting the report, presents a strategy to defend against AI threats, responsibly employ AI for national security, um, and the broader technology composition for the sake of our prosperity, security, and welfare. Um, the report states the US government cannot do this alone. It needs committed partners in industry, academia, and civil society. And America needs to enlist its oldest allies and new partners to build a safer and freer world for the AI era. It goes on to recommend, um, provide recommendations for leadership, talent, hardware and innovation investment um, at its core, and obviously expanding much further beyond that. Um, so with that introduction, I'd like to hand it over to our Truman, North Carolina esteemed member, member Igor to kick us off with your thoughts on this report and um, how we should be thinking about AI and national security, broadly speaking. Yeah, hilariously, not to go too black mirror on you, I had our AI read the paper itself, the document itself, uh, uh, because of it, it being a 756 page tome. Um, and, I hope you uh, paid them for the time. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, and, and that's what's neat about AI, right? It does what humans uh, do at scale, right? That's, that's the way to think about it. So broadly, when you think about, you know, what, 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 allows um, you know, uh, uh, America to dominate the information age and what have you, it's the productivity that we were able to get out of every citizen and every uh, uh, role or, you know, through the adoption of, of technologies to have better governance, you know, reduce fraud, you know, corruption uh, and the like. That's, that's why it's such an important piece of technology, right? You know, every citizen of ours needs to be as productive as, as 10 or 100 citizens uh, elsewhere. Uh, because we just don't outnumber, um, you know, the the populations uh, over overseas, um, and so when when you're when you go ahead and ask that question, are we prepared? The answer is no, um, and there's uh, multiple facets in terms of why we're not prepared in terms of appropriate immigration policy, in, in terms of appropriate education, in terms of uh, incentives to private sector. Uh, in terms of more rapid adoption of the technologies, you know, given that, you know, the, the security moats that typically exist, uh, you know, between the stuff that's getting discovered, between the fact that in some cases we're, you know, uh, having our own goals in terms of exporting certain technologies overseas that are, you know, uh, allowing adversaries to close that gap as well. There's not one thing that's pressuring you know, uh, where we are today with this AI issue. Others are signaling, obviously, that they'll, they'll have a, a five-year plan to close that gap even more 
uh, aggressively. And uh, Michael, not to steal some of your thunder though, um, you know, we can leave with a hopeful message, which is to not uh, out China, uh, China. And I know he's, he's going to explore what that means. I've taken that to heart, which is how do we become a better version of ourselves in order to address, um, you know, this upcoming competition? Yeah, I appreciate that, Igor. I think, um, you know, first to everyone on the call now, just want to express our appreciation, you know, very personally and humbly that we have the opportunity to share. And frankly, that you have the genuine care and interest on the topic, a topic that will underpin conversations of a generation, but for so many years has gone relatively ignored because when we discuss AI, it's like you throw, you don't throw the kitchen sink out the window. You want to throw the whole kitchen out the window. And from Jump Street, for most in the AI community and the way that we think about these things, and even how it's defined, frankly, it's this idea that you know, machines will perform tasks that normally require human intelligence. And while it's correct and precise in a certain way, I think we can very quickly unpack the problem with this definition in practice for our workforce, for instance, for our kids, for society's collective understanding. And the problem is that's a rolling definition that we self-perpetuate. Under that definition and what we think about traditionally, you know, uh, and, uh, an abacus was AI. TI-83 calculators, which I think hold a special place in all of our hearts, those were AI. Uh, Google ex or Microsoft Excel was AI. Now Google search is AI. And furthermore, we anthropomorphize it with this nod towards the human domain. And we just keep this cycle of living in the trough, the disillusionment with statements such as, well, that's not real AI when we're otherwise missing the boat to capitalize on the ways it can, does, and will profoundly impact us all, our pursuits and our efforts. So for the purposes of discussions, for the ways that we should think about it, simply put, AI applications are just designed to analyze data and formulate predictions without any overall guidance from us. That's it. So regardless of the technique, the semantic games people play around you, researchers or even companies, Hopefully what we wanna do is move beyond this conversation with a better foundation of that in mind to no longer have this what is AI conversation because it's been years too long. But definitions only do so much. How should we think about it? Think about it in a way that's beneficial to humanity, that's beneficial to us and to business. Think of AI as a flashlight, a mirror, and or our canary in the coal mine just illuminates otherwise ignored or undiscovered latent patterns memorialized in the world around us, which just helps us strategize by asking new and different questions. So whether it's at the global level in international competition or whether it's in our homes, we have to wrestle with understanding emerging technologies every day and signal demand that learning is a lifetime sport. We're at an inflection point. And what we wanna do is ensure that we at least to some degree understand it to the purposes it doesn't compromise us in the future, that it reflects the best of who we are. And that's what makes this entire topic different is that if we have the foundational understanding, we don't throw the kitchen out the window, we have it operate with us in mind and don't try to out China China. I think that's, it's really, really hard to top um, Igor and uh, Michael um, coming after them. So thank you for having me here. Uh, I'll just give a couple of uh, quick brief comments um, in light of the NSCI report as well. The first is that uh, I think sometimes we confuse artificial intelligence and machine intelligence. I think humans have for the longest time ever built tools that extend their capabilities. And that is one of the reasons why I think we are slightly different in the sophistication of tools that we have built. Uh, we have built tools and machines that have helped us grow beyond our capabilities, helped us get to space. And I think of AI or uh, I, I like to call machine, it machine intelligence because it's different in terms of intelligence. Uh, to give you an example, uh, if I show you a picture and of some person and say, guess whether this person is happy or sad. I think most humans can do it in under one second and fairly accurately. It is an extremely complex task for machines to do. Whereas if I give you two eight digit numbers to multiply, a machine can do it much faster than, uh, than an average human can. So I think there are different axes where uh, humans and machines excel. 
and I always think of it as um, uh, as a cooperation as opposed to competition with each other. Um, competition makes for great Terminator style movies, but I think uh, there is a very good case that we can work with AI. And I want to lead to the point of uh, revolutions in society. We have the agriculture revolution, which essentially drove down the number of humans required to produce a pound of grain. And over time that has grown down and down and down and through better uh, ways of uh, farming methods, uh, agricultural seeds, so on and so forth. And then we had the industrial revolution. So you had all of these artisans who were making these fancy embroidered piece of, pieces of cloth and God knows what, um, the machines came in and they were able to build higher quality, more consistent product. I think in both of these in revolutions, one of the things was there were certain characteristics, you needed land, or you needed enough order volume or raw materials to be in a certain place for the people where these revolutions happen to benefit from them. I think AI is also a revolution. And this is why it is important because it is much more democratic globally as a revolution in the sense that anybody can participate in that revolution. It is not linked or blocked by who has access to land or who has access to um, better sources of cotton or a larger market demand. In fact, the raw material for AI data, a lot more countries might have a lot more data. I think that's where uh, the discussion on China comes about or maybe India comes about. Uh, but the it is a combination of technology advances with the data it operates on. And in context of how we look at national security, if we, we I think in the US have a very head, big head start on the technology aspects, if we can build the collaborations with our uh, allies on the data aspects of things, I think it's very hard for this juggernaut to stop at that point. Yeah, that's very helpful overview and introduction, each of you. I feel like I have 10 more conversations I wanna have on each of these different points. <laughs> but let's start with what you just said, um, Ashish, about uh, the data and how basically the quality of our AI and the direction or maybe even bias of our AI is directly related to how much and what type of data that we have and where we source that data. And the we um, here could be at the country level um, or otherwise. And you mentioned collaborating with um, you know, political partners um, to sort of do a better job at at uh, working with maybe, I, I'm putting words into your mouth, so I apologize about working with broader data sets. What does that look like um, for you? What, where do you see us as you know, the US collaborating when it comes to data? And, and I'll start with Ashish, but please you know, um, feel free others on our panel to address this. Absolutely. I'll uh, maybe just quickly, when we talk, I, I've worked a lot in social media by the very nature of social media, you get data from all over the world. So you're not necessarily limiting yourself to observing patterns in the US. Uh, before I worked in this field, there was a predominant um, uh, feeling in my head that people are unique in the sense that people's behaviors in the US are unique uh, and different from those in Canada and those in, the Indi in India. But after I started working in this field, we find that humans are creatures of habit and there are certain groups and those groups transcend geography and backgrounds because they are driven more by their nature than their um, how they nurture, you might say. So there are people who go to work every day and they sit an hour in commute and they watch uh, videos while they're on their commute and that's common across the globe. Uh, so there are, there are methods like this that will help you. I think when we talk about medicine, um, having a wider uh, base of people which on which you can get evidence on efficacy and efficiency of medication is very important. I think if anything, that is one of the challenges that um, medicine research today faces, which brought to light when the COVID uh, vaccine times where they had to make a special effort to get to um, uh, some categories of people, whether it was African Americans or Latin um, Americans and figuring out, okay, does this work at the same efficiency? And if we start collaborating and thinking in terms of global trials as opposed to local trials, I think the overall data situation becomes much better. It inherently goes to one of the challenges with data, which is often talked about, which is bias. So as an example, if I were to train a system and took every 
picture of a person who was ever incarcerated in the United States. I think we can all imagine what that would be biased towards, right? Um, and that I think is an interesting question. Maybe if our data sets were more global, maybe the biases would even out. I think uh, Igor, you were mentioning uh, something uh, just a, a prior to this discussion about uh, women in the military in Israel um, and many other countries who are on frontline warriors. So if I had a, a, sec a, a set of pictures from the Israeli military, I'm more likely to find maybe women there as compared to maybe militaries of some other countries. Um, similarly, NASA scientists versus I, I look at the uh, Indian equivalent, which is ISRO. Um, bulk of the scientists uh, there are actually women, um, including the uh, fam now famous Mars mission was largely driven by women scientists. So if I had a larger data set, maybe I would have less bias. I'm not saying that completely cures bias, but I think it normalizes for our society. I'll stop there. And Michael, I think you were trying to say something. No, I, I really appreciate that that these ideas of representation in data and fairness. And, and we characterize it often in the concerns about bias, but also, you know, ethics are more are more broad than that. But on that bias point, you know, most of us believe we're fully aware and consciously in control of bias inclinations and opinions and that we can intentionally include or exclude them. Now, however we see fit, but the truth is, and we create data, we're relatively unable to separate ourselves from biases or our biases from ourselves. And we're equally unaware of the many prejudices we hold and accordingly unaware of the many ways they influence our behavior. So regardless of how objective, unbiased or enlightened we think we are, we each have underlying unconscious tendencies and tastes and some aversions and distastes. It defines who we are and bias not to walk in front of a car. So what we wanna think about is, is when our actions and preferences are memorialized in data we create, so too are the biases upon which they're based. While we often try to grapple with this conversation at this really kind of esoteric level, at a simple level in your businesses and your practices, you should just wonder if a few key points. If the reality is, is that as AI stands now and will, will stand for the remainder of the future, um, unless some other breakthrough comes through, it's not going to know anything but its data. So think of that as akin to worldview for us and maybe place that worldview or data on the y-axis. And then think about the x-axis and we're going to call that scope or reach, number of people it impacts. When you start to kind of chart out some capabilities we have, we very quickly realize I don't want an Alexa in my home only trained on Southern white gentlemen, nor do I want it necessarily on just people from Northern California, right? It's not fair or representative of the scope of its use. And once you start charting that out and asking that question, perhaps that starts to turn into some regulatory framework or kind of concept of operations of questions we're asking ourselves. But I do want to highlight this point. We often pay lip service to discussing artificial intelligence, but it's just the top of the proverbial stack of a whole bunch of other things. That is data, algorithms, models, and then we're using it for predictions. If this country does not figure out how to bridge the digital divide or actually put some time and effort in people being represented in data in their cities. For instance, I just recently did a hackathon for the city of Detroit where I'm from, and 40% of people don't have internet access. What do you think is going to happen when it relates to data? It's the 21st century version of have and have nots. And furthermore, it makes us less performant without having more data on the international scale. So by servicing others, both in rural and urban communities, which, you know, in this case, they have the exact same problems. I think we're going to be better served to have this conversation in the future. That was really helpful. And I, I really appreciate your example of Detroit. Uh, I, a lot of my fellow Arab Americans live nearby. Um, and you had actually mentioned something uh, in our previous conversation as well about how the time that um, Detroit lacked or 40% of people in Detroit lacked internet access, that same time could have been used to help uh, train and develop the workforce 
And, you know, how are we using our time in the pandemic, I think is an interesting question. So I want to take, there are two directions we could go with some of the conversation we've just had. Um, I want to take it back to the, you, a couple of folks have mentioned interaction with regulations. I do want to take it there for just a little bit, but then I really do want to loop back to representation and bias and and just kind of stay there for a little while. So let's take it back to regulation. You know, I've seen um, over the last couple of years, I think we've all seen a lot of attention, particularly towards big tech um, and how big tech is interacting with Congress um, and what kind of, how are they trying to get ahead of some of the regulation? Where do regulations serve? Um, our interests as individuals, as private sector leading in innovation, as government, as ethics, um, and that sort of interplay and interaction um, because big tech isn't homogenous by any means. And there's definitely been quite a debate amongst some of the larger players as to um, what their interaction should look like. Uh, I, I appreciate hearing a little bit more from, um, you know, from each of you about your thoughts on what that should look like. I also really appreciate, for example, Igor, you led earlier with immigration policy and as that relates to um, talent. So um, maybe starting with you, Igor, and then um, you know, going from there. Yeah, and, and, and before we leave the bias thing, just know this, all technology, whether we're talking about um, uh, AI or if we're talking about life sciences is in a halfway house right now. It's Im immature. This is why we have bias because wherever we could find data, we use to train our models. That's it, feature engineering, and obviously now as, as it moves more towards neural network. So as there's more data, you know, I think things will, will even out. But if I think about what is the pinnacle of AI and what is the pinnacle of life sciences, it's actually exactly the same thing, which is the equivalent of personalized medicine, where it won't matter anymore. What's it, once it can conform to, to you, your speech patterns, your 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 sentiments, and all of these style of things, then you'll have an AI for one person, and it's just not quite there yet. And that's why we're 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 talking about, um, you know, the fact that it's not well represented right now because they were moving to where the wallets were, right? Corporations are actually very very simple uh, constructs. They move to where the money is and where the wallets are. That's why they do the things that they do. Now, on the point of regulation, we have a problem. Half of Congress thinks the internet is a bunch of tubes. Okay, and so how are they going to regulate it? I remember, you know, being in a, uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one chat with Hugh McCall, the former CEO of uh, Bank of America, and he said, "Look, um, sure, there's there's regulations that are applied against us. I love them because it actually constrains the uh, the amount of new entrants that can come in and compete with us because it takes, uh, you know, a, a, a certain a profile of company that could even address this regulation, but it's." But at the same time, I have enough lobbyists and I can always pay my people more than the regulators can pay their people in order to always find a, a, a way to you know, get around this so we have freedom of action. And so that's what I hear from, from some of the you know, more legacy industries that already uh, encountered this regulation. And look, us as technologists, we barely understand the limits to these technologies. Why? Because they're relatively new uh, constructs and yet, you know, we're going to be trying to apply, you know, regulation, you know, to this um, a moving context. Now, of course, the Europeans and, and uh, the Californians are, are, as usual, on the leading edge to try to, you know, figure out uh, the boundaries of what privacy means, you know, with this style of technologies. You see, you know, certain companies like Apple that are in the forefront trying to figure out where um, people aren't sure how to solve it yet, but the first step is to at least be aware in terms of what information is, is being re recorded. And with that, I'll, I'll pass it off, off to everybody else to fill in those blanks, what that means. I really appreciate those comments from Igor. Um, we're talking about responsibility and it should be a foremost concern. And we have to recognize upfront, whether you're in government or business, mistakes will be made. Let me give you a compelling reason for this conversation which is a needed one and it's best crystallized by imagining dilemmas, whether you're in the government or you're at a company um, or you know, public service more broadly that you'll most assuredly face. The first is beyond the fact that it's the right thing to do in line with our values is that whether there is a mistake of our own doing or stems from someone with a bone to pick agenda item, 
um, from the Hill press or public, whatever it may be, our executives have to be able to answer the following simple question from a pretty comprehensively defensible public position. The question is this, what due diligence did you perform on AI when the mistake was or is made or an individual life was or is disenfranchised or taken away as you continue to talk about integrating AI into all aspects of your business? Let's call it like it is. The answer now would be wholly insufficient. In fact, it would be nearly unanswerable and it exposes leadership credibility and potential negligence on an international stage and exposes our arguments for public service. We couldn't point to enough informed leaders or offices with the appropriate authorities, knowledge of operations, or even understanding of AI to defend diligence across the life cycle. And with this technology, that life cycle is much more than just the express use of it. And hopefully the real conversation for us is that whether we're truly prepared or hold it a priority and informed in this holistic perspective to institute as we've done so many times before, reasonable ethical and moral development of technologies or whatever it may be into the lifeblood of what we do. Now, I know this sounds maybe a little esoteric, fanciful or intangible, but people are exposed and we do at least need to pay attention along the way. It's a hole in our armor and it's the right thing to do. And the argument as best expressed is the question if you're in business or wherever, wherever you are, when you make a mistake, how are you compelled not to do that again? I'll use the classic McDonald's example that people always find interesting. It's when someone spills coffee in their car on themselves and it burns them and maybe they have $30,000 of hospital bills. How could they possibly have sued McDonald's or whomever it may be, or a big company or the government for $80 million for that? Well, the answer is because you have to compel people not to necessarily do that again, right? And that's a huge risk. And right now this notion that um, we're not paying attention or could answer, I did my best due diligence along the way the mistake was made. That's what ultimately exposes us. And then on the technology front, back to this digital divider being underrepresented, it's a tough question. You know, are you an, this idea that you're an Apple, I'm a droid, you're a green text, I'm a blue text? Well, by definition, then necessarily speaking, you're not reflected in that person or that group's technology. Um, and we're going to have to grapple with what those answers look like. Uh, but I do want to highlight the push for we can do well by doing good. And that's the big shift that I think we should be inspired about, not just reflecting things in quarterly earnings statements. Um, I'll probably take a slightly different take on regulation um, from just so that uh, people hear different opinions. Um, <clears throat> the... The question I think for regulation is, are we regulating the science or are we regulating the application? And right now there is no clear answer is because the companies are in charge of the science and application. Traditionally, we have had science being done at educational institutions and academic, at academic institutions and the applications being done at the uh, companies. Now, the biggest research labs in AI are funded by Google and Facebook, and they are not altruistic by any stretch of imagination. They are a for-profit organization. And I don't think I'm going to fault any of the companies who are funding research in AI for being for-profit. I mean, that is their mission. They are being true to their shareholders. Whatever research they do, as long as it helps them make fundamental advances and generate more profit for their shareholders and their employees from those research, they are going to do it. That means that there will be places where they may not fund um, something adequately, but I don't think that is necessarily their challenge. Um, so the, the call to action for me is to figure out a way for uh, the United States to figure out how can we do better research and separate out research and application. Application is where I think regulation belongs. Like I don't want to restrict fundamental research in nuclear physics just because somebody can make a bomb tomorrow. Like I do want that research to happen, but I want strict control so that nobody can access the fissile material to make a bomb tomorrow. But I do want that research to happen. I think that is the challenge I find with AI is because we have conflated the research and the application into one organization 
we are facing a lot of challenges and maybe there is something we can do there. I'm just a two finger this one. I'm really inspired by Ashish's point here is that they're not doing wrong. And we got to have a real conversation about the inherent duality and application of these things. Not, again, we're, we can't always throw the kitchen out the window. The narrow and specific purposes to which we ourselves put our machines will be where the solutions reside and the problems arise. But with these technologies, they are inherently dual use. For example, the greatest advancements when it comes to team play and strategizing right now are literally happening on a war game in games like StarCraft and Dota and the rest. Furthermore, some of the best advancements in, for say, the medical field in order to detect breast cancer in mammograms, like with deep fake techniques and technologies and other sorts of underlying you know, mathematical approaches is the same stuff that makes mis and disinformation. So decoupling those two conversations will be critical, but at the same time, this research is a little bit different because while nuke research could sit in underneath the University of Chicago and nobody's gonna see it or be able to touch it, that's not quite like open software right now. And that's why this conversation is so difficult that Ashish raises. Michael, you totally read my mind on that one. I was so glad that you took that thread to the duality. Um, and I think it's really important, you know, and I hear what you're both saying about um, on, on some level, not vilifying either an application of AI or um, where we are in terms of innovation or who is in charge of that innovation, who's leading it. Um, and I, I think it's a really interesting distinction that you've made, Ashish, as well about historically where regulation happened and that it happened in the applications and that research was housed more so um, in a non-private sector space or that, that it wasn't directly connected to those who were also applying it in a for-profit um, mechanism. And so, you know, I think one of the things that we've discussed before as well, when it comes to that awareness, you know, for, for the rest of the world, whether you're a national security professional or, you know, or not, basically, um, how, how are we interacting with AI already and don't even realize it? And how do we um, identify our own agency in those interactions and then um, share those with with the generations coming after us, whether that's through parenting or through education. Oh, holy smokes. It's, a, it's, ev it's, it's everywhere already, but yeah, Ashish, take it away. You, you have a uh, guilty just, face. Your, your stuff is everywhere. Can you see this picture behind my hand? No, no. When you're a little bit, yeah. The so red. I'm just giving you an example of AI in action. This is a virtual background. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's around us. Uh, I was just trying to make a point, uh, saying that like things like these, like virtual backgrounds. There's a humorous story about a lawyer who became a cat on Zoom, and was trying to explain to people that he was not really a cat. Um, when we tag our friends in photos and pictures, and uh, when we talk to our virtual assistants, when we ask Alexa to play something, like these are so many applications of AI that are just around us. Um, it is like, uh, in some ways, like the example that I take is um, ABS, anti-lock braking systems. Every car's got it. It is probably the first uh, system that does not respond or uh, to human control. Like, it doesn't matter how hard you slam the brake. The system says, nah, I'm not going to slam the brakes. I'm going to pump it. Um, so systems like those have existed for us. And systems like these where um, you can probably see portions of my couch as I may wave my hand behind me um, are becoming ubiquitous. And they don't seem that dangerous at the first instant. Um, and then it all depends on, again, the application of where uh, things can be taken and which context that it can be used and how much do you want to extrapolate uh, with it. I'll pass it on to others to, to, to comment. Um, goodness. Well, well, you didn't even bring up the recommendation engines that you're infamous for, right? 
So uh, you didn't want to go there? I talk about that. I still need a job, man. <laughs> <laughs> You know what? Uh, uh, when, when I think about recommendation engines and and the ability to essentially uh, give people rapid knowledge acquisition, you know, in in the case of of um, of uh, taking somebody through onboarding expertise, right? So think the real life equivalent of of uh, that character from Matrix blinking their eyes and and learning how to fly a helicopter. These are all positive uses in fraud detection, right? You know, the technology is already uh there but you know i i always say this you know um the tech industry builds hammers um and they're not sure exactly all the possible use cases for them but they're envisioning handing it to jimmy in uh, jimmy carter's hands so that he can build habitat for humanity and then when you talk about dual use somebody discovers oh i can also hit somebody over the head with this uh to harm them and that and that's we've seen that since literally the beginning of time the fact that i took a hand tool and described it that way and i was even describing a piece of technology that's what inevitably um uh you know happens which is why she previously mentioned uh the difference between the fundamental science of something and then the the application uh of this technology in terms of exactly what are you um uh regulating it's hard to regulate science because the genie's out of the bottle. Somebody's going to be weaponizing AI. They will be. They will be connecting into a trigger. Michael, you and I always discuss the fact that you know we, um, you know, we have a, in 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 Western um, uh, you know liberal democracies. There's that ag agitation and and unease about connecting the trigger. Uh, to it, and yet, what's going to happen when we start losing a few battles because people, you know, don't uh, some adversaries don't have a problem, um, you know, letting their drones just uh, go off kilter, if you will. It's not going to be long before you know we we breach that gap ourselves. Yeah, and I think that's a great segue into um, what are some of the current urgencies and um, in terms of where we should be focusing our innovation. Uh, trends. So, you know, we've talked a little bit about how we are already where we may not have realized we were AI isn't something that's way out here. Um, it's a part of our daily lives, whether we, as you've mentioned before, Michael, open our phones with our iPhones with our face or any number of other sort of da daily use applications. Um, one thing and how that relates to preparedness as our uh, uh, of a society, of our society, and I'm talking about not just education, but inclusion. Um, so when I think about preparedness, you know, looking back to the report that we um, brought up at the very beginning of this conversation, um, and some of the conversations that we've had in the past, the report has an entire section focused on hardware, on the development of microchips, and who's in charge, you know, who, who owns that process. Igor, you mentioned earlier, um, you know, what we are able to export versus import. Um, in our previous conversations together, we've talked about supply chain um, as well. And so I'm curious to hear your perspectives on some of not just the current trends, um, you know, such as, you know, maybe where we're going with voice and voice recognition, um, where we're going with visual recognition, but also how we can be more prepared and where we should focus that education. And then we'll, um, we'll go back to loop back to that earlier conversation um, at the end of this part of the discussion as it regards to education and inclusion. I, you know, I think that Igor and Ashish will be very good at describing where things are going and what we see is coming back in vogue. But I think we got to get back to being practical and pragmatic about the conversation at hand. I had mentioned earlier that we're talking about AI being the end state of, it's more like a journey. It's doing a lot of things well, or just learning, I like calling them learning, you know, technologies, et cetera. But you're talking about data, algorithms, and models. Each of those informs another, none are more or less valuable than the prior subsequent. But at issue is that whether we're revamping how we do business as a, as a private corporation or an organization in the government, we tend to focus on serving up predictions in this really cool end state of using AI, equally unaware of what the intended clientele is or our ultimate customer, what we're trying to do. The sensible thing to do that's, that's illuminated in the NSCAI report is to imagine a world where we have the most elegant solutions, the most performant algorithms, 
um, that we're consistently talking about or just put as lightning bolts on you know, slideshows. And the question to ask is, if we had those predictions, could we use or deliver it if we tried? And the answer far and beyond is no, whether it's in a business concept or for myself in war fighting concepts, the answer is just no. And one would reasonably then ask, well, why can't we? And voila, that's where investment should be. That's where a dogged focus should be. And with all that said, regarding current conversations, concepts, and strategies, we are in the digital age. The tech is profoundly innovative and cool, but whether you're in private or public sector, capability is not strategy. And recently that seems to be the purveying description of plans, which is more or less to say, one, we have a data problem or we need to access more. Two, we need to make decisions fast and accurately. Three, let's do AI. And the fourth, we'll dominate our industry or in our case, competitors. And I love AI, but AI alone is lazy, dangerous strategy and it is rampant. It's a tool, it's the end state again of a journey, albeit an extremely powerful one that has implications that are different from the rest, but it's nothing more than a crucial arrow in the strategy quiver and the result of doing the things I mentioned before really well in business, which in government and for private business alike and in society are currently going under addressed, underfunded, misunderstood, traded down, not being risk blind, but risk averse to, or, or risk averse, um, flip those. We are risk blind and we use a euphemism for risk averse and we need to wake up on that topic and pay for the building blocks to get there. I like that AI is a crucial arrow in the strategy quiver. I, you've been so eloquent today. I feel like I need to just go buy your book as soon as we get off this call and read it. Um, I, felt, I felt that way the last time we spoke as well. Um, and I really appreciate the distinction that you're making um, and, and that we're focusing in on what, on that predictive state without necessarily seeing each of the pieces that go into that. And then ultimately, can we even use it? Um, and so can we apply it? Um, and so I, I think those are really important questions to ask and I appreciate those. And I'm curious if um, Ashish or Igor, you wanted to add any thoughts to some of those building blocks and, and maybe, you know, you mentioned earlier, I think it was you Igor who mentioned earlier that, you know, we're kind of in this nascent state still. Um, we, we're not as advanced as we're gonna get. And, and one of you has said in past discussions as well, I think Ashish, it was you that, you know, if we think about where we were with the invention um, and launch of the iPhone, which really wasn't that long ago, and look at where we are today, just imagine where we're going to be with, you know, the, and not just the use and the advancement of AI as a technology, but also how it's integrated into our daily lives. And so I'm curious to hear um, your thoughts on that as well. I'll start with a, maybe a funny anecdote um, uh, because uh, Igor is not sharing any good jokes today. I was uh, looking forward to Igor's jokes. Um, <laughs> a friend of mine uh, shared a job uh, posting for um, one very large uh, predominant tech firm um, for their mobile app offering. And the, uh, the job specifications at 15 plus ex years of experience in building mobile apps and I pointed out to him that in 2007, um, which was <laughs> less than 15 years ago, the iPhone came out Whoops. and the app store. <laughs> <laughs> you are, basically, this job description is going to invite people who are going to fake <laughs> resumes. Um, I think the point is that the technology has been moving really, really fast. And um, we sometimes don't uh, think about it. I also, I'll share another anecdote that in 2001, I uh, was in the in, in the Bay Area, and I decided with a couple of friends to drive all the way up to um, uh, Lake Tahoe. I'd never been to Lake Tahoe. That was the uh, e that was the pre GPS era. Like GPSs came out um, after deregulation by Bill Clinton in the 2000, 99 2000 time frame. They were not the commercial devices weren't just like you can't go to a car rental and pick up a GPS device. So we printed out maps, and duly we got lost. Now, if we think about where we have come in the past 20 years, that pace is very, very rapid. And the only point I want to make is we are leaving a lot of people behind. 
And that can be a liability for uh, especially an aging population in some of the other parts of the world where the population is more younger, they have opportunities to retrain. I feel like even AI can be used for retraining and education itself. And we need to retool much rapid, much more rapidly if we are going to become a strong nation in this. We can't bring us become a strong nation in AI by only having 5% of our population contribute to it. Yeah, here, here's an interesting thing. So um, I remember um, getting interviewed by popular science or popular mechanics. Sometimes I get them confused in 2005. And they asked me, hey, what's something that's coming that, that um, you know that everybody's going to be doing? And I'm like, well, we'll be talking to our television sets. And then I got really angry because uh, they, put, they put the interview with the cover America in 2025. And I got super angry. I threw the magazine across the room because I said, holy smokes, I don't want to wait for this until I'm like Professor X in a wheelchair, for God's sakes. We already have this technology in the lab. So we had it. And it took 10 years uh, before uh, that was adopted in the Amazon Fire TV where people can finally talk into the remote controls to uh, pull up uh, content. Now, a lot of that we were driving up for accessibility reasons, but now obviously it's reducing the distance between people uh, and content. Similarly, the things that we have are the equivalent of F-22 fighters uh, in terms of what the technology is. And yet, because you have to go through the lens of what's the business case to adopt these uh, technologies, certainly in the commercial sphere, um, they just want to use it for milk runs right now. Why? Because it's it's nascent in terms of even the business placement. It's not just innovating. It's also you know figuring out the right uh, place um, uh, to uh, apply it is, is rather difficult. And the reason why it's hard to figure out where to apply these technologies and why you're seeing it typically reinforcing ad-based businesses uh, is because AI is non-deterministic. It's not you know input and output that 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 is uh, concrete in the way that um, uh, more traditional software can be thought of. It's the fact that uh, it guesses. They're really smart guesses, but you know where the guesses are most valuable to, tends to be in ads, in fraud, in places of that sort. But you know, in order to see it in wide expansion, this is why you know AI companies actually only have one product, and that's accuracy. Um, yeah. Yeah, and that's a great point that leads me back to the sort of the teaser of the conversation that we had at the beginning. Um, I actually posted on Twitter, speaking of social media, I posted on Twitter right before this talk, an article that was published just yesterday by the New York Times. Um, I'm going to read you the title of the article. It is who is making sure the AI machines aren't racist? Um, and this was just published yesterday and it, it profiled in particular a couple of women, one who's a woman of color who were recently um, sort of pushed out of one of the big tech companies. And they were in directly involved in the sort of ethics of AI conversations in that company. And, you know, when we talk about representation and we talk about you know the quality of our data and the power of our data and how far we can go it, you know it comes down to not just the bias that's presented in our own um, the data that we're giving up every day because of our own inherent bias but at the broader scale as a country um, and sort of as a society what bias exists there um, and then on the sort of flip side of that I guess as well um, the importance of representation in investigating that bias, but also, and we've talked about this as already as well to some degree, um, being at the table in those conversations um, as the technologists as well. Um, and I bring this up not to put any kind of, you know, this isn't a, uh, this is a complex issue in that I, I don't mean to put blame on any one actor, whether it's um, an employer who's seeking out, you know, talented uh, employees and technologists or, um, you know, a particular educational institute, but we have to look at the interconnected complex reality of, um, of our society and the role, the importance of, of sort of going a lot further back in preparing the next generation 
to be those um, at the sort of leadership level, be those actors who are pushing the needle forward with the innovation, but then also in our own homes, you know, everyone kind of having that agency and awareness um, as to what they're doing with their own machines, with their iPhones, um, and, and how they, the information they receive, how that may have been um, biased in a particular direction. So I know it's a loaded topic. Um, I'm also going to give us a time check. So we thankfully have until um, 4.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time here. So that's an another 33 minutes. So we're going to have this conversation. And then I want to go ahead and let those of you know who are live with us um, uh, attendees that if you want to ask any questions, uh, for now, go ahead and put those questions in the question and answer function here in Zoom. And uh, we will be getting to those after this part of the discussion. So if, if your wheels have been turning, go ahead and start thinking about putting those questions into the chat. Let's return back to this um, conversation. Who would like to start? <laughs> I, have, I, I like this conversation. Yeah, I think up front, <laughs> the community cannot keep looking like me. The proverbial boardroom that looks like every other boardroom has to look different. The problem is, is we're in a vicious cycle keeping the same old going. And there will be a day when we might call or refer to this time, this generation, this inflection point is like the great nap unless we collectively change this. Each of us should have our own individually unique and meaningful journeys towards understanding AI. The problem is, is we think it's just for tech people um, or engineering, which, yeah, I mean, that is predominantly male as things have stood. And AI, robots, automation, algorithms, all those buzzy things you hear so much about, they're going to infiltrate our lives and empower them just like electricity does. But unfortunately, it's going to disenfranchise those not, again, represented at all. And if there wasn't a single advancement today on, it will still profoundly impact human opportunity and experience. And furthermore, to this point, this year, the U.S. is going to graduate 50,000 people with STEM-like degrees for 500,000 open jobs. But we live in a world where the barriers to education have never in some ways been lower. They're accessible, but not accessible to all. So I don't care if you have a college degree or not, have you done it, can you do it, and do you have a passion to learn it, and how do we as a nation help drive down the gap is what really matters here. Because in just a few short years, that number jumps to 1 million. So we have to reimagine what this job space is and who can fill it. It's 2021, the digital divide still separates youth from education, our rural and urban communities from opportunity. These technologies are infringing on human rights across the globe, yet society doesn't discuss or at least generally aware of the compromises we face. And we can all influence the path and provide opportunities for others like our kids, friends and neighbors. And mark these words, the future rock stars in tech will be teachers, sociologists, dancers, artists, psychologists, parents and more. So just ask, what are you doing to better understand and help others do the same in ways that matter uniquely to them? Do you love dance? Help someone dance with a robot. Are you a writer? Show them a language transformer. Are you a psychologist? Help us deal with how people will handle life changes stemming from tech. Are you in wildlife or nature preservationists? Let's use computer vision to track and predict concerns and outcomes and where lions are migrating to and the rest. Are you a political representative? then help us bridge the digital divide and present it to more than just affluent white people. The point is, is AI is for everyone. So we, us, you listening, we can be a part of changing that part at least. That was super inspirational. And thank you for those really accessible examples as well of, of how AI can apply in these different spaces. Um, I want to point out that I'm very well aware that the three speakers on our panel today are men, um, uh, people who identify as men, and and that's okay today. But we hope that this will change in the future. Um, I also have noted earlier when I was reading the uh, I didn't read the full 756 pages yet um, of the report that just came out, but um, of the listed authors, uh, 15 authors, as far as I can tell 
probably about two of those were women. And so here's our call for change and call to um, not, and it starts with ourselves, um, our own education and awareness, but also our interaction and, and sort of challenging those around us, whether it's our peers, our colleagues, um, our representatives, or um, our kids and our friends' kids. Igor, I think you had something to say. And also I'm gonna say that we're gonna play with one of Igor's um, AI tools towards the end of this conversation. So stick around and we're going to take live questions from the audience and put them into his AI. So um, I'm also an Eisenhower fellow. And one of the things that in, in inspired me vis-a-vis -vis, uh, improving access, and, and by the way, my, my own background, it's not about STEM, it's STEAM. Both my parents were artists. Right, and just to ju just to throw a curveball, I was giving a clubhouse uh, talk uh, a couple weekends ago, uh, and MC Hammer comes on and asks me this question: Hey, will the concept of multimodal neurons help identify bias in these models and help us unravel this? And um, I'm like, well, um, by you even asking this question, that certainly blows uh, stereotypes out of uh, out of the water for anybody. The fact that you're helping, you know, emerging youth, um, you know, tackle this topic and and uh, represent somebody from the community that that is interested in these uh, things. Um, there's a lot of creativity associated with solving these things. That's why you know that's entangled together uh, with uh, education. And so one of the things that were was uh, inspiration on why Eric Schmidt raves about. Um, um, Michael's book is the fact that the um, uh, way back when uh, Eisenhower saw that we were going to have that shortfall, even immigration won't solve that that delta between the number of people uh, that we need to solve this problem. And so what M Michael reminded us that when Eisenhower sat there and saw that shortfall, he passed the National Defense uh, Education Act in order to get more people uh, compelled in, into that work. And by the way, when you look at the teams that created Alexa, when you looked at the teams that created uh, Siri, when you look at the teams that created um, Cortana, Watson, and all of these things that you take, not only is there, are there immigrants, you also have creative types that are there. So I'm actually heartened about the age of augmented intelligence where we use these tools for and, and actually democratize access uh, so that more people can leverage these style of tools. And I think that will inform uh, more rapid um, uh, innovation. So, Michael, I don't know if you want to add uh, to what that program was all about. I think I think very briefly, 1958 at our Sputnik moment, which most people don't understand what was going on then in 1958 and why it was called a Sputnik moment. So, the sense of 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 peacefulness and calm of our nation was compromised. It wasn't because a Russian satellite was in space. It was the intercontinental ballistic missile technology that broke this sense of of, of an ocean separating us. And what this ended up doing um, was inspiring this National Defense Education Act, which was upwards of a billion real dollars then, which goodness knows how much money that is now, to put back into and almost created much of the academic network and university system we see nowadays. Because at this point in time, people were taking home at classes. Homemaker was a literal career. And what we had to do was re-inspire and provide traditional engineering, things that we saw before. And 10 years later, what did we do? We won the space race. Well, that's not happenstance as those people who are learning along the ways ended up getting into the workforce to inspire this stuff while we kind of woke up from being back-to-back -back world champs and were dead asleep at the wheel. I'd sense right now is a little bit like that. I will just add, I think uh, the challenge is still pretty much real. Um, I have a daughter in high school in the Bay Area and um, she's hopefully my contribution to STEM field. Um, but uh, the, the daily struggles she faces in school, uh, I think the bulk of the problem is in my opinion in schools because if not enough people graduate from high school wanting to be in a STEM field, you will have a problem when they get into college and then a correspondingly lower number will graduate out. Um, to give you some stats, and I might be pulling this to a very, very core area, but look at the gender differentiation in APCS um, and AP um, Calc AB and Calc BC, actually. They, these two courses are considered very core for computer science education to get into college. 
and calc vc has the biggest gap in the gender ratio of how many men versus uh, women are taking uh, ap uh, calc vc why is that whereas on the other hand ap statistics which in my personal opinion is a much better course than calc vc um, nobody wants to take it because the universities don't deem it uh, math enough and i'm just my mind is boggled because when i do uh, this machine learning if anybody came to me for advice i'd say take ap stats don't take bc because you're not never going to use most of what you learn in bc you're going to use most of what you learn in stats and the stats basically gets you into a ba degree not a bs degree now these are so many i think intrinsic problems in how uh, people are being incented to learn different things and how they get into colleges i think we are in this mode where we want to break the rules but we don't want to break the ruler we all want change without changing and i think from the ground up our university system how they admit students how they straight jacket people into certain courses and things to the points that michael and ego were making about artists and dancers and and environmentalists being able to learn these tools and technologies we got to stop straight jacketing people that much i think we we have to provide a lot more ways for people to get educated and that continuing education piece i like to mention i've been in this industry 20 years 20 years ago ai was not what it is today it was mostly a bunch of statisticians we didn't have the amount of computing out the data i've been mostly a self taught uh, person on ai and machine learning it's taken me like i've been doing this for the past 10 years and it's not been easy those things through coursera and other places have become much easier to find education but the interesting thing is people who run coursera don't accept uh job aspirants who have taken a course at a course so it's kind of like there is some i think a cognitive dissonance that is also happening that while we are saying hey take this six month course or a certification but when it comes to evaluating candidates we are still looking for a bachelor's degree in that subject we are not willing to take a six month certification so as employers as hiring managers as university uh, guidance counselors as school guidance i think a lot of these people need to also get Uh, education on how to help um, us get there. And Ashish, um, my principal engineer at the last company that became Alexa was only a high school graduate. My head of research last time uh, only uh, received a master's level. Um, so, you know, we we do tend to weigh people individually because of their um, you know creativity. One of, one of the things that I know that um, Michael also calls that, and by the way, Ashish's book is, uh, you know, Michael's book lays out the strategy and, and is actually similar to BBC Connection style, like this led to this, led to this, led to this, and this is why the environment is this way. And where Ashish's book uh, actually picks up the baton uh, in a way is to say, okay, now that you're curious about this, you know, here's, you know, here's some ways that you can actually literally get your hands um 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 you know dirty if you will to start exploring how this stuff actually works and then you figure out you know now that you'll have an understanding of it what can you build for yourself versus end up buying uh, uh from other uh folks the 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 chinese sputnik moment was was alpha go deep mind beating them at go that's it now why is that that it, why is that interesting because that game permeates their culture and society for what millennia right and so they knowing how hard it is for a human to master that game um just knock them uh, off their chairs when they so what similar thing exists in in um uh in uh, you know what i would consider in uh, in our society where our own citizens would be knocked off their chairs knowing how difficult a particular task is and the fact that there's an ai uh that's out there i mean it's almost like we have to get to the point where where an adversary knocks off our lights everywhere for people to understand how uh dangerous uh and challenging this stuff is because we are um you know a heterogeneous culture in many ways we don't have one thing one game that we play like the armenians are obviously uh um uh you know uh, chess permeates their culture and so when uh, uh deep blue uh, you know ended up beating uh, kasparov that you know uh, created uh, a renaissance if you will in terms of thought around that as well so part of that is the fact that you know we don't have this sputnik moment now 
uh, it's, it's still um, uh, a rather abstract notion to most of our population. Yeah, thank you all of you for those comments. Um, you know, Igor, you've said something, in, I've heard you say this a few times before as well, and I'm just gonna share it with the group. So this is Igor's thought that Rome flourished when um, it had opened up, right? And I think, um, you know, that speaks as well to your immigration policy comment at the beginning of this conversation um, and thinking about how we can reach, um, not just think about uh, innovation in an abstract way, but how it can apply to meeting the needs of our fellow citizens and what that means for us as good citizens and what our civic engagement even looks like. And I think um, we can speak a little bit more about that intersection in just a moment. I, I want to now move, thank you, those of you who've stayed with us for this long. Um, I wanna move to some of the questions that we've received. So I'll just um, remind those of you here, if you do have any questions, please drop them in the Q&A. Uh, my very good friend <laughs> and grad school classmate and fellow Truman member who's currently based in Germany, Erica Castor, has uh, a, a question and a comment. Um, you know, and I'll agree, I'll agree with her on some of the things she said as someone who's sort of straddled um, the, the, the different types of sciences almost by accident. Um, honestly, it was our econometrics course in grad school that pretty much got me into a, a statistical analysis and um, computer coding earlier career. Um, so <laughs> very barely coding, but still. I didn't realize the importance of it until afterwards I, I was in the job force. Um, but Erica asks, um, she mentions that uh, with respect to some of Michael's earlier comments about getting every one of all stripes involved. And I think as she, she actually also spoke to this, um, she mentions she's not you know, an IT or she's not a technologist, let's say, but she is an AI enthusiast. And as a friend of hers, I'll attest to this. Um, and she does want to engage AI folks to do stuff that improves the performance and precision of her sector um, and her industry. So it's not entirely clear to her, um, and, I, and I would uh, add on to this, you know, who, how sort of the average Jane, if you will, um, who has big ideas can get, find the right technical talent to, to help her, um, you know, to help figure out how to solve some of those problems, to maybe join up um, and team up together. Not everyone is the kind of employer that Igor, I, I hope we have more people like you. <laughs> Not everyone um, sees talent for what it is. Um, and Ashish, I think you were speaking to this as well, the importance of sort of going beyond the ivory tower in that sense. Um, and interesting that the example of the mobile developer uh, looking for, or the person looking for a mobile developer who's been around for over 15 years and that is not even a thing. Um, <laughs> so yeah, you know, do you have any suggestions? I'll start with Michael because that question was directed um, a bit more to you, but then, um, you know, moving to the others in particular, do you have any thoughts for um, someone with Erica's profile about how to, how to engage and then build? I wish I had better suggestions. I wish there were companies that you know, we're more openly hiring these notions of AI ethicist. I mean, I think we're seeing the rise of this. That's a viable and very vibrant career field to get into. It's difficult, however, or, you know, for instance, if you're with a, with a company, mis and disinformation specialist, right? That's going to be a job or something that, for what it's worth, is probably not going to be a technical person, but who's an enthusiast for technical things. So I wish I had a better answer of, man, I wish I could just walk into a business right now and explain to you why you need me, right? And, and flip your whole model because what they're going to say is, uh, well, okay, but I'm worried about today. I have a fiduciary responsibility in my shareholder. Telling them I'm doing right with AI doesn't exactly pay my bills as I'm about to pay you. So the point is, I think too, is that there's a burgeoning community of people to be a part of to showcase your thoughts and without having some concrete answer of like, this company and this group of people love hiring this and talk about it. I think the best thing to do is just be, you know, bold and open about sharing your thoughts, whether that's with the people who are talking about existential risk or more everyday people about the applications and risks at hand. Put yourself out there because I, I've found that 
Um, so long as you're not bashing on one of the, those communities, you're probably doing okay and they're gonna be appreciative of, of being there and who knows what opens up. And just to answer these specifics, uh, sorry, you got to go, go ahead. Okay, um, so just to answer maybe specifically, Erica, um, I think the biggest decision you have is, do you want to do it yourself or do you want somebody uh, to work with? Um, and there are different paths to doing it. I always feel that there is some merit in attempting it yourself first, just to get a sense of the scope and the scale and the complexity so that you can ask better questions of people you might work or collaborate with later uh, to do it. There's a whole bunch of fantastic resources that can, uh, within a few weeks, you will be probably writing your first um, AI system or classification model. It might, it may not do much uh, when you in, in, for the first version that you write, but I think it will give you a very good sense of what the technology is capable of, and then you'll be better informed into do you want to dive deeper into the tech or do you want to collaborate with partners? And there's lots of different ways to collaborate with partners. There are firms who specialize in this. You can set up an academic research collaboration. It can be a fantastic PhD project or an intern project for somebody to gain some experience. So there's lots of creative ways to go about it. And I'm also happy to help um, directly if you need to reach out, I can give very specific um, resources or courses. And a lot of people approach me today with the same question, like I want to get into AI, how do I start? So I have a templated answer of like five resources. It's not overwhelming. And it's like, if you go through it, then you'll know enough and you can get the, from there, you will figure out your own path. Yeah, the late comedian Gary Shanlin once said, there's no shortcut to comedy. Um, but at the same time, I, I think, uh, you know, Ashish and Michael, myself can get you started. Like, hey, here's some of the things that um, that that I would start poking and prodding around and, and learning and engaging with. I mean, that's why they're even here on this panel. Why? Those are, you know, some of the tomes that I reach out to, right, with respect to building up thought leadership uh, in here. And they have a unique perspective in terms of um the, 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 the governance and framing this, uh, you know, from a geopolitical standpoint, but also the, the concrete um, uh, deployment of these technologies, you know, certainly in, um, in a, a commercial uh, context. So I would say, get started there. At the same time, you're not gonna have a recipe, right? The reason why we throw that creative angle is you're all, you all have, uh, you know, diverse backgrounds. You're going to have diverse interests, um, you know, in terms of where you can place these technologies. And we need that genetic diversity, if you will, in terms of people, you know, trying to unlock these doors from different uh, perspective. And so we don't even want you to learn the same stuff that, that we've learned, right? It, it has to be, um, you know, just a different twist to solving these problems because you may address a concern or, a solution in a different way that we would have uh, been able to based on our, our our formations. Thank you guys so much. And um, Ashish, I'll be following up with you to get that resource list. Um, thank you for offering that. Uh, it's very much appreciated. Uh, we have two more questions here in the chat. I then have a fun last round robin question, and then we can play with Igor's AI. So I, I hope we can get to all of this in the next 10 minutes. Um, the next question is from Elaine. Um, I'll just read your question. It seems the excellent panelists, thank you, I agree. They are amazing, have, have mentioned three key dimensions to AI, it's development, R&D, it's economic applications uh, and political and or social applications or implications, um, such as improving diversity. Um, what is the, the relationship between the three remains a bit unclear. So what resources exist beyond a webinar like this to better grasp how these elements should interact to achieve positive goals, such as better environment, health, liberty, and so on. Let me start with this simple thing. You can break everything down to carrots and sticks, right? So, you know, in some ways, you know, the regulation is, is making sure we keep bounds on certain things so that our society can absorb uh, some of this innovation. In other ways, if, if we want more people to be educated, if we want the commercial sector to do you know, X, X, Y, and Z, put the right incentives in play. So for instance, if I hear another, um, you know, member of the C-suite whining that there's not enough STEM graduates, and yet they took, you know, a big reduction in corporate income tax rate, instead of saying, no, no, you know what? Let's take 1% of that and make an evergreen fund so that any American 
uh, citizen that wants to be educated in this field doesn't even have to twinkle or think about you know paying uh, for university. And so put your money where your mouth is. Stop whining that you don't have this capacity uh, in terms of workers and you have to bring people from overseas, which we have to anyway, in order to, you know, um, uh, to increase our capability and, and throw curveballs at, at the way that we're developing this technology, but also develop, you know, you know, the, the talent that could, you know, go into it if, if they were not encumbered by, by certain constraints. And so it's getting those in, incentives aligned uh, across the board. And also, you know what, you're going to fail, you're going to fail, your experiments are going to fail. And so, you know, in Wall Street, they're very careful about that, because they can't have experiments fail, you know, too often, and, and you had a reduction in, uh, in R&D expense. And we have to grow that in other areas. I mean, what did the moonshot cost us? You know, you know, quite a bit in adjusted dollars. And yet it spurred you know, a, a big uh, evolutionary drive towards the modern world that we see today that many of those uh, technologies that we take for granted could be rooted uh, in that as well. And so we're going to have to, like, for instance, one of the things that I hear in, in China is that they have these big funds, AI funds in every uh, city, where as long as you show up and you can fog a mirror, you, you get an investment in your startup. Why? They're just trying to maximize the number of shots on goal. And knowing that 99% of them are going to fail, but they're counting on that 1% to actually break through and innovate in some critical uh, element of, of, um, of their ecosystem. That's fantastic. And it also brings us back to that question of some of the differences between the US and China um, and not trying to out China, China, but what, where, we can, where we can do better. Um, Awesome. So the next question we have here from one of the attendees, in the context of our conversations uh, with US policymakers, what elements of the AI and national security conversation come up most frequently? Are they actually asking the right questions? And what do you wish they would ask you about? So I'm going to start with Michael, because I know he has these conversations all the time, um, and then go from there. Uh, all right, we'll start it with a quote. The limits of my language mean the limits of my world. Let me tell you how much I love being asked questions about artificial intelligence or what we should do with it or where it should be placed by individuals who don't know what happens when you type an S on a keyboard to make it go on your screen. You know, there are moments in our personal lives and professional pursuits where we look in the mirror and we ask ourselves, do I understand what I'm talking about? Do I get the values um, that I aspire? and do I even know a little bit of how to get us there? We're too often speaking above, below, past, and through one another. And to Igor's point, we often lament about the problems at hand um, rather than uh, just think to ourselves, okay, so what are the missing components to fix the issue, right? We imagine these magical strategy coins rain down from above every time we say great power competition. Well, we said that four years ago. Right? Like, what have we done since then? I think that there's a serious conversation to be had that, that hey, four years happened since we said that. What, what have we really done? And it would be primarily based on the fact that we're not truly educated on the topic. We still say the words, but we don't understand the components. And then furthermore, to Igor's really, really great point, it's that, you know, we don't have the people, but even for a percent of, you know, the budget, you, you didn't educate anyone about it, right? It's a dwindling afterthought, the people. So I think that what it comes down to is, um, it's not about the questions that are asked, it's about the lack of action and trade-off and priorities and to pragmatically step our way there, which is you wanna do some artificial intelligence and why are you driving down you know, IT expenditures? <laughs> it doesn't align, it's not gonna work, right? So I think that, that's kind of what needs to happen right now. And in that proverbial boardroom, the person who knows about artificial intelligence or who knows about IT technologies or cloud probably doesn't look like you and probably is from a different demographic and that's okay. And that would probably fix the problems we have. Awesome. Thank you all for those comments um, and for your questions. Real quick, one, Phrase answer. 
of all of the tech innovation. Okay, let me let me start over. Which current day tech innovation exists that you really wish you had when you were a little kid, and why? Language transformer for writing papers. Or creative <laughs> papers. That's awesome. I'm gonna go with the video calling. Um, and I would have met and have spent so much more time with so much more family um, if, if we had something like that. I also grew up at a time where phones were a rarity also in India at that time. So I grew up in Greece uh, and I wanted machine translation to talk to dolphins because they would just uh, uh, swim into our lagoon. Um, and then you wonder, you know, the jobs that we all chose later in life were directly inspired by play, you know, which is why, you know, when, when um, there was um, uh, another recent discussion on AI and creativity and what that meant to dance and art and, and music uh, and, and the like, I'm like, look, um, uh, have any of you recently spoken to a five-year-old and asked how they leverage Alexa and things like that? Because I have written patents based on their answers. Hmm. Literally based on their answers. You know why? Children are unfiltered humans. They don't, they don't think about, hey, that's an oddball thing to have, you know, a dinosaur, you know, riding in Barbie's car, sprouting wings and things of that sort, because <laughs> it's in that creativity uh, that, that um, there's lots of innovation that, that hides. And we all remember, you know, as, as children playing with toys, what are these things, but not the same thing in, in, uh, in grander terms but also targeted towards, um, you, know, you know, serious problems that our community has. But also not only just the negative stuff, we focus on a lot of the negative things that we're trying to solve with these technologies, but we're also trying to reduce the distance between people and knowledge and, and help inform accessibility, uh, both in terms of, you know, uh, you know, engaging more people into the workforce, uh, but also in terms of reducing the distance between them and e education, right? That's what's super exciting. There's AI helping things like SpaceX launch satellites for bringing broadband access to some of the rural counties and and to hopefully the other ha uh, you know 40% of Detroit, Michael, that doesn't have access to this yet because no teleco wants to go ahead and, and wire uh, fiber into those homes. Well, you know, where there's a will, there's a way and water will find a way around a rock. And, and not only that, we'll eventually have that on, on the world stage. Uh, and there will be bad actors that will leverage these platforms to amp amplify disinformation and, and do asymmetric power, you know, by virtue of sitting in Sudan, perhaps with one of these SpaceX uh, satellites. But, you know, there's always a lot more children that build, build sandcastles than kick them down. I love that analogy. Um, and thank you for reminding us in terms of our framing to think about the positive as one of our questions related to how can we integrate the different ways of thinking about AI, AI um, to, solve, to solve problems, right? Not to create them. Um, I loved each of your answers. Um, and I'm gonna just throw in one real quick thing. I think, you know, given one of the questions about and in the conversation about the structure of education. I'm going to plug anyone who has, I don't actually have kids yet, but I'm planning to do this when I do. Um, work, get on your school board, <laughs> go to those PTA meetings and insist that we have these conversations, that we talk about the intersectionality of these different disciplines um, and that we explore and invest in STEM and we talk about AI um, from when they're littles up through those high school courses when they're trying to decide what AP course they're gonna take. Uh, with that, um, we will, I, I'm gonna close it now, but I'm gonna keep this Zoom open in case you guys wanna stay and play with Igor's AI. We'll do one quick question because we did start a few minutes later. Um, but if you need to leave, we totally understand. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, Igor, do you wanna, uh, what, what's the question that we should ask the audience for for this we're winging it a little bit yeah we're, we are um so think of a question that you would ask that uh that nsc report on ai the commission's report okay um that's for the audience first folks in the audience we talked about um the beginning of this talk the massive national security um 756 
page report on from the National Security Commission on AI. What question do you have for it? And we will play with with Igor's AI. Let's see if that's we have not mine. It, it, it took a lot more than one person to make this off of decades of, of, yes. of improvements. Igor, Igor's just sharing with us. Is anyone? See, I'm, so I'm trying to see if we have any. Okay, so we don't have any um, thoughts from those in the participants. No. All right, so panelists, what question do you want to ask this 756 page? The question that Igor just asked. I love this is okay. this is like okay. real and this is what works. So the question that Igor's asked is why is immigration important? And we immediately got 10 possible answers from the report. Yep. Yeah. And so um, awesome. uh, reform is look, um, stone soup parable. We need we need different vegetables to make these things. You can't just have one. Um, and 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 the point is, not, what's interesting um, that you got a wide variety of of uh, answers is the fact that uh, the report is highlighting this over and over and over again. And you know, one of the things that that Michael's um, uh, book addresses over and over again is is uh, um, the NDAEA that was first used during Eisenhower's era in order to help um, uh, reduce uh, the distance between us and, us and the solutions to these problems as well. And so now, um, you, know, you know, folks like Michael behind the scenes have been championing um, a, new, um, uh, a new version of it in order to close that gap both domestically and with uh, uh, immigration. And I know, uh, uh, Michael, you had, um, um, you know, beyond the N NDEA, there's uh, certain things that are showing up at the next NDAA, right? In terms of new uh, language capabilities as well. So I'd love uh, for uh, for you to chime in on on what that what that means. Yes, yeah, to a certain degree, we're really successful in this 2021 National Defense Authorization Act, which is probably, you know, took years. But the thing we're most proud of is that we will treat. Uh, computer language aptitude and proficiency. So that is our ability to learn languages and our proficient expertise in a certain domain, the same way we treat foreign human languages in the Department of Defense, which is now coming down the pipe uh, in two years. And that comes with the authorities for incentive pay and the rest. What we're trying to inspire here is that we're contemporary innovative partners and we need more of that. So imagine if you will, come to the Department of Defense, learn these skills, and you're 95% of the DOD is my, you know, transitory. They're only here for four to six years. And then they go out and become those CEOs and executives and people like Ashish and Igor and look back fondly upon us. So efforts like that is what we're hoping to, to keep going. That's awesome. Um, I'm so glad, you know, and I just, if, to plug that that work took many years, am I correct? Michael, so Good. just, you know, for those on who are live with us or watching this recording later, um, keep up the good work. Um, it is a marathon, not a sprint on some of the policy reforms. And um, thank you for your efforts, <laughs> Igor and team. Um, that was awesome. Thank you for the live demonstration. With that, I think we should wrap it up officially. Um, thank you. Uh, Michael, Ashish, Igor, so much for making time, honestly, um, to have this conversation. I've learned so much. I feel very honored to have the privilege of having this conversation together with you directly. Uh, thank you to um, Igor for, for bringing his friends along <laughs> to this uh, inaugural, I should say, Truman National Security Project North Carolina chapter event. So look out for a few more things from us with some of the amazing thought leaders we have in our chapter like Igor. Um, thank you to the Truman National Security Project um, headquarters and staff that are here with us today um, for bringing together this amazing group of people. And uh, with that, I hope you all have a great rest of your evening or morning, wherever you are and whenever you might be listening to this. Feel free to reach out to me directly if you have any follow-up questions as well, and I'll see if we can get them answered. My email is jennifer at jenniferatala.com. Um, and with that, I'll say good night. Thank you very much. Bye.